Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast, Full Goon Squad, back in the house. Yo. Hello, gents. Yo. What's up? Hello. On this episode, we are going to be talking about the concept of creating general physical preparedness for the sport versus sport-specific movements. We're going to talk about them from the context of an open athlete all the way up to a CrossFit Games athlete. But before that, make sure you head to our Instagram page and click on the link tree so that you can sign up for training camp at CrossFit Raid. It is, we'll call it uh, Philadelphia. It's not actually Philadelphia. It's really close to Philadelphia. So you'd be like like flying in there. It's like a borough, right? Yeah. Close enough to cheese steaks, right? Whatever you call it. Yeah. (laughs) Friday, October 11th through Sunday, October 13th. Uh, Make sure you get signed up for that. It's a really cool experience. Um, Lots of nasty workouts, lectures. Most importantly, you are in a room with like-minded individuals, fellow misfits. Um, You get to meet in person, you get to create those connections, and you get to hang out with us. So head to Instagram, click some stuff, get signed up. You'll love it. Do it. We're also brought to you by... Proper Fuel, you can head to properfuel.co, use the code word MISFIT to save, sharpenetheaxco.com, use the code word page, P-A-I-G-E, you will save 10% on your order and Paige will get 10% of the order as well towards her CrossFit Games journey. And last but not least, misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs and teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs. Gentlemen, live chat, what the fuck's going on? Sure, how was vacation? Vacation was great. We avoided uh, the big one pushing the little one into a stone hearth and being pushed off the dock. But I will you mean say, like narrowly avoided. <laughs> no, like I, it, the two concerns I had on vacation, oh, okay, Got were it. from the big one beating up the little one was pushing him into a brick hearth or pushing him off the dock. Neither of which happened. But what is the a baby, brick hearth? Like what the fireplace sits on. Do you know how your fireplace is typically not on the floor? It's like elevated by brick. So that you yeah. like don't burn a hole in your floor. Uh, so there's yeah. a there's a small like gas. So stove. annoying to have one with a baby. Yeah, <laughs> I have it's one. Super annoying. It's awesome. So they'll eat just... themselves off that shit without a brother pushing them. So yeah. Nice. So my concern is the big one's gonna get annoyed at him grabbing his toys and just like check him into that. You know, his head will hit off the bricks and we'll go to you know the hospital instead. We'll be on vacation. So I avoided that completely. But I could not keep the baby from wanting to run on the dock. If any had a chance to be on the dock, he wanted to run on it. And he had a couple of hilarious yeah. falls off the dock into the water with me there, which, you know, just like slow motion fall onto his butt and then fall backwards into the water and then just oh. like be submerged. And like, I have to like reach in, grab him, pull him back up on the dock. He cries for like one tenth of a second. And then he's like, let's do it again. It's like, can we not do that again? That would be great. You're um, still under trauma age, so it's fine. It's just yeah, I'm falling. Yeah. So he, he had a good time. <laughs> The, the weather was kind of spotty the first couple of days, but the rest of the week was gorgeous. And it was like 85 and sunny most days. So can't complain. I go back in 18 days and then I have one more week in August. So we sprinkled the vacations Damn. across across like the whole it. summer. Yeah. So three weeks on, one week off. Should be a good time. So yeah, it's a great time. That's neat. That was the golf scramble. It was, it was great. actually really fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, a scramble for only nine holes is very nice. If I was on the exact same team. Is that like an attention span thing? No. The teams matter a lot (laughs) for your personal enjoyment. Um, And I could have done 18 holes with the team that I was on, but if there were four of me, 18 holes would have been fucking miserable. So like... (laughs) Like I, I again would do, I would do it again and play with them, but like again, if if it was four people that don't golf on the same team, it would not be fun. I heard Hunter golf. stack the team so that he could win. Hunter True did false, a little Hunter. bit of like uh, one for you, one for me kind of a situation. <laughs> <laughs> Hunter that took our most friend. rambunctious member on the team and the best golfer in the gym. Uh, Although I don't, did you know that he was the best golfer in the gym, or is um, he? I, do you think he's better than talk- Alex? Cardamone? No. Yeah. Not not now, at Who's least. Who's the best he golfer might, in the Maybe gym? he was. 
Andy Bowden. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, oh, dude, he he strolled yeah. up and the just the swag to his step. Did he have those little remotes that you, control his bag? I knew. Like you just <laughs> no. walk in the bag, his remote control beside him, rolling down the fairway. No, Andy had played for allegedly played for a very long. I mean, allegedly, he definitely had played for a very long time. He's actually building a house right now on Pinehurst. Which is where they had uh, <laughs> yeah. the major championship the fucking a couple golf weeks mecca. ago. <laughs> yeah, so he's he's played for a long time. He hadn't played. I think he said he hasn't played in like three or five years. Like seriously, he might he's probably gone out a couple times. But um, I knew he I knew he played and was probably good. Um, and he's the he's an older guy, but he's got the. Uh, the va- he he's got the accuracy of the old man who walks down the riverside golf course and just 150 yards straight down the middle except Andy's the crossfit version of that so he can actually melt a drive 250 yards straight down the middle of the fairway and then the rest of his clubs oh, were were working could pretty he good beat too, joe so. biden in golf that's what i need to know it's just handicap <laughs> yeah, that, 6 that might, no that might be that might, that might be yeah that might be my life chat when i was watching the debate joe biden god damn it was, it was so six, good uh, it was a six handicap and i was like you are like he quickly I, backtracked and said eight though can you all right so i'm not uh, a golfer yeah. The yeah. explanation here is that, like, on average, he's six over par. Is that what a six handicap means? Trip's not a golfer, but he is yeah. handicapped. That's that's effectively <laughs> what it means. It's it's yeah. a little bit it's a little so bit more complicated. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But yes, that's that's the easiest way to. I could just translate. translate. When on, he was alive, he was an eight handicap. <laughs> is what he said. <laughs> yeah, when he was alive, six hundred years ago. Dude, where, can get, where can we that get where can we get that long drive contest would be in, Yeah, I mean, in his defense, Donald Trump also said he's won multiple club championships, yeah. which is equally as suspect as Joe Biden claiming. He's Dude, a you seen that dump truck, bro? He drives that ball nine hundred yards. So perfect. That guy's got a fucking dump truck. Is Trump like his Kim Jong boyfriend, where he just hits hole in one? All the time. Only hold on once. <laughs> hold on once. He hit a he hit a 18, 18 on an eighteen hole course. He doesn't have a butthole. Yeah. He's never pooped. <laughs> God damn it! Let's just watch the interview. Fuck this. <laughs> Senior swing. Oh God damn it! I'm gonna put the rice in. So yeah, it was hand. fun. They, we actually used some of my shots. That was uh that was a, the goal of the day. Nice. I hit a few fairways, which I did not expect. Was that it was a close surprising. game? Like between yeah, the we lost by we lost by one stroke to Hunter and his ringer. <laughs> Dom had a tough day, so okay, this is who's this Dom? Is literally is that a member? A, this is a social chat that no one will have context for, but I'm going to do it anyways. Dom got a tick between his big toe and whatever the one next to it's called, ring toe, <laughs> pointer toe. His pointer toe. Yeah, his pointer toe. Po- his pointer toe. toe. Was hammer he toe. got a tick in there, he thinks, back weekends ago when we were together at the lake and found Man, it and superpowers. pulled it out, and then his foot blew up. Like, it, it the, the photo was crazy. It's disgusting. I'm and he ended right up now, having to go to the it. ER, and they're running all these tests for, like, like how what the infection was, and maybe he's got that tick, or he, he dies if he eats a steak. Um, but he was hobbling. He, like, could barely walk, and he had... He had the seven ugliest shots of the round, which is really saying something if I'm on your team. He had a tick between his toes for weeks and didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, that's his that's his hypothesis. That's, that's the craziest thing. Mean, you said, let you me walked see that up foot. to the clubhouse <laughs> limping. I was like, yes. Dom, what the fuck has happened? Like, what happened? He told me that. But he had gout like, again. Just pounding wine every night. <laughs> oh, Donnie. Donnie, Donnie. Oh, Donnie. <laughs> He responded to me really fast. He said, LOL, why? And like one second after I texted him that, I said, let me see that foot. <laughs> That's amazing. Give me that foot. Don't respond. Ted, Just leave it Ted like Hunter, that. Ted Hunter, you got to swoop in with your life chat. No one knows what we're talking about. I've, uh, so I've been working some smoked meats lately. I've been Holy fuck. Working, Sorry, on, <laughs> working on trying to, uh, trying to perfect my ribs and get chicken that doesn't suck. So... Yep. It's been been quite a journey. I've done a couple of racks of ribs. Ribs are really easy, I've discovered, to to smoke. Chicken is not quite as easy. Um, but I think this week I'm gonna try to do a big pork butt for the holiday. Yeah. See how boy. that boy goes. I don't know it if it's go well. Is it <laughs> I like easier that, I like or that, I feel like that's gotta be hard to fuck up in that thing. Yeah, I guess that's no you can you can it, you can get it you can get it dry if you don't do it right. I'm, I think brisket's the hardest one to do. I was going to say, what brisket about a brisket? Brisket is real finicky. 
That's, you have to you have to really oh, know what hard. you're doing. Luckily mm-hmm. though, the like the methods that you find on the internet are very straightforward. Yeah. It's basically just if you don't do it that way, you're kind of screwed. Right. Because obviously you've got the you've got the cap, you've got the fatty part, and then you've got the lean part. And if you don't the thing get with, that whole situation right. The thing with brisket though is if you don't want to be eating at ten fifteen at night, you gotta get up <laughs> at like four in the morning to put it on, don't you? Yeah. yeah. So I like guess I could start hour? the night before. Yeah, I don't, that's I, what's great 12, about having a dad and brother who text each other about smoked meats all the time. So you just, <laughs> I go up to camp and they've got like 19 meter probes going and we're like six miles away from camp. And Matt's like, all right, brisket's at uh, 162, just ticked over. And I'm like, you guys, the food's delicious. <laughs> so I'm just like, congratulations. Uh, I'll, group chat. Nice job. I also had a question for you guys, uh, not related to smoked meats, but related to uh, zone two-ish stuff. So if I'm going for a run and I'm hoping to do zone two and I miscalculate and I'm at like 155 instead of 142 for 25 minutes, what yeah. is the difference? What's the difference between doing that that and doing like proper 180 minus your age for 25 You're minutes? You're just exercising. For you, Ted, respectfully, just fucking keep getting after it, All right. kid. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yep. I recommend for a lot of people, well, tease this a little bit but i'm gonna ask i'm gonna go in the misfit athletics instagram somewhat soon and ask for 10 volunteers to test pilot test a gpp program um and one of the like hallmarks of it is zone two work where you're basically walking slash rocking um that is one way that you have to be in pretty damn good shape or be like a former runner to actually go run and stay in zone two. Mm. It's it's challenging. Okay. Like it takes a while for people to get into that. So you can load up a backpack and get yourself closer to that. Um, zone one's awesome. Zone two is great. And where you were, zone three ish is also completely fine. Um, it's more about like if you are going for GPP, it's just move. Okay. Like figure out what like. Like some people get really bored and they want to run a little bit harder. And it's like, unless you're training for sport, I don't care. Okay. Congratulations. Go for it. Go for a run. So I really just don't want my heart to feel like it's going to explode every time I do jujitsu. That's, that's, that's my goal. Get that backpack. Start rucking. I don't need yeah. a backpack, bro. I'm wearing one pretty much all day, every day. <laughs> all right. We're I don't backpack know all day, that, every day. I don't know that yes. you could walk yourself into zone two, Ted. No, might be able to, but I think depends on the temperature be. outside. <laughs> yeah, true. No, it was like ninety fucking, when I did with, it the other without, day. And without without like without walking. weight. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty. Uh, tough. It'd probably be pretty tough. Yeah. I mean, it's probably a good question to answer for the listeners though, because like the group for like I was somewhat in jest for Ted, but that wasn't somewhat. Ted. You well, I mean, it it was it was a little bit of a joke, but only because I know Ted is like trying to get back into exercise compared to many of our listeners who are like, it's the same you know, for me. It's binary. If I'm exercising, days thumbs up. Right. But for, but for like, let's clarify, like for someone who's training for CrossFit and is using zone two as a tool, like we would actually want that person. It's like, actually you're probably going too fast. You'd be accumulating yeah. yep. what the endurance community might say is junk volume where that zone three zone four isn't like, you're you're trying to do two things at once and therefore you're doing nothing so yep. for that type of for the competitive crossfitter the extreme the high level fitness person maybe not so much for the other you know 90 percent of the population 95 percent of the population like heart rates up exercise is happening good job keep doing that that's one of the reasons why i like the the bracketed um notifications on the garmin so if you're listening to music through your watch on the Garmin, you can set heart rate zones. So when I was starting like big mileage zone two, I would have the 180 minus my age is like, tell me if I go above that. Um, and then like maybe 170 minus my age or even lower, um, the, the bottom, the floor of my zone two. So if I got over, I had to walk until I crossed my floor and then I would jog. I would just do that back and forth. And it was kind of fun to play with cadence and breathing and pacing and figure out what is it about the way that I'm moving or the, what I'm thinking about or how long I'm trying to walk, like go that's making me get over that heart rate sooner than other moments. Am I running up a hill? 
Am I stressed out that I'm, oh, I think I'm breathing heavier. So then I jump three to five beats because of that. So it's just nice to have the like, has a little like whistle and it has like an uptone and a downtone of when you're doing that. Man, so even a little um, tiny hill really changes your heart rate oh, quite yeah. a bit if you yeah, yeah. try to keep the yeah. same speed. And the like ultra trail running, some of the best in the world walk hills for that reason mm. and then just increase they like hike the hill and then they increase pacing on downhills interesting so yeah that'll fuck your heart rate up real quick well, i realized that when i got home everybody. i was like doing the math in my head afterwards i was like ah i was like 10 or 15 beats per minute off on that calculation i think i was thinking I it's 190 binary. minus my it's age good... and that's why i fucked up mm. but yeah. yeah yeah whatever i got sweaty i was breathing hard my yeah. knees hurt yep that's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. Knees hurt. Sweaty. I said it before he said that part. <laughs> I don't know. He said I got sweaty. Must have been delay. <laughs> road <laughs> road delay biking would be a good way to do that too, Ted. Yeah. You, know, you used to do that a little bit more. Yeah. It probably better for the knees. That's for sure. Mixing it in. For These sure. old fucking knees. They don't like that shit. Trumpet. You got any live chat? I played. Uh, I ended up. I went down to a. Uh, very nice golf course on Sunday with a buddy, couple of hockey friends of mine. Uh, and that was the, that was probably the first time I played at like a really like legitimately nice golf course. The, uh, and it was, it was very hard. Pissed. The course was, the course was rated, uh, significantly harder than most of the ones that are right in this area. So yeah. that was kind of a cool, cool experience to play on a, on a much longer, more difficult golf course. And then a course where the, the greens were extremely difficult. Like you, if you land a ball on the green, there's no chance. There's no, there's no guarantee that it stays there. And then, um, if you miss, you know, miss hit a chip shot or you putt, you're putting and you give it a little bit too much gas. That thing is fucking six miles off the green, uh, just cause they were so fast. So it was a good time occupied most of my Sunday, but nice. well worth, well worth it. Golf course of New Golf Club of New England, GCNE. Hmm. It's in Strat Stratum Stratham, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice. Who rates the golf it's courses? A, Me. From. No. <laughs> um, I don't know if Three it's the cap. USGA or or who, but it's basically a combination of like combination of how players generally shoot on the course, and then there are things like how many hazards there are, where the hazards are located, the difficulty of the hazards, the type of, like, a lot goes into it. And it basically, that impacts the handicap system, the handicap system impacts the play, all that sort of stuff. So it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty in-depth game. Like the, like golf itself is pretty universal in how like people play it and how like courses are, are rated and stuff like that. It's much more, universal than than most games i've ever or sports that i that i know about it's pretty cool fancy to you i got my golfing in for the decade <laughs> <laughs> fuck it's all right Jen, I'm back and so played later <clears throat> i'm gonna open the floor sherb and, and hunter i'm gonna open the floor to just address the concept that I brought up at the beginning. So this idea of I want to compete in the open quarterfinal semifinals of the CrossFit games, and I have an entire off season to improve myself. Um, how am I thinking about movements versus general physical preparedness? And we would define that quickly within the guise of the sport as solid energy systems, short, medium, and long, strong power output skilled like like the things that apply in a more general broad sense how do you guys think about that when you're approaching an off season uh i mean i'd look immediately at the things that held me back either the last season or the season before or if there's like a long-term trend something that's really holding the athlete back and like just like say running for example if you're a terrible runner and like you want to be fit it's probably a good place to start it's low-hanging fruit so I'd probably start looking for a low-hanging fruit to start with. Um, and then depending on how big a weakness is, will determine the runway for how much time I spend working on that thing and how much attention it needs um, throughout the season. I do think that rotating through things is a good way to keep athletes invested in their training and not to get them tapped out on something 
because it's too redundant. You're doing it too often. But, you know, I'd look for low-hanging fruit. And at the end of the day, I'm going to ask the athlete to work really hard at building their conditioning up. Because if you look at like the, the pyramid of the theoretical development of a hierarchy of an athlete or wherever that word, fucking soup word goes, uh, <laughs> I can never remember that the exact phrasing there. But the idea here of like, I want to address kind of the base of the pyramid before I work upward. And it's highly unlikely that someone's weightlifting is the number one reason why they aren't a competitor at the level they want to be. It's obviously a nice thing to kind of work on, but for most people, it's just, I have to get your engine better. And there's got to be low hanging fruit. There's got to be something you're not good at right now that we can put a lot of effort into um, and highlight just slightly more than everything else and see a general rise in everything else fitness related. And then, you know, once that box is checked or once that slider has kind of come up in line with some other things or it's in the vicinity of other things, then we move on to something else. So um, I like a somewhat systematic approach, but it's important to me that variance remains the entire time. And it doesn't feel like my CrossFit athlete turned into a runner or my, you know, my weaker CrossFit athlete turned into a weightlifter. Like we need to still have plenty of variance in training, but if there's low hanging fruit, that's what I'm going with first. Yeah. The, I mean, it's a, I think I like to use like, current existing models to help kind of get a starting point and i think the crossfit the way that crossfit defines fitness and general physical preparedness is and it's like that's what we're training for the people who program all levels of that competition are basing programming off of the crossfit methodology so it makes sense that we need to address what you said drew at the beginning one of the models of fitness crossfit uses is the the energy pathways so um, it's pretty, I would say the most common thing is an athlete identifies a single or individual movements as deficiencies and kind of to what Sherb said is that it's probably unlikely that there are single movements that are holding you back and more so, uh, things that either relate to each other as far from a, from an energy system standpoint, maybe it's a general physical skill that's lacking, whether it's like maybe, maybe an athlete has poor mobility or flexibility or something like that. Maybe there's a lack of the more like maybe athletic uh, elements, the coordination, accuracy, that sort of thing. Or maybe it is some raw strength, power type type things, but it's rarely ever a movement. I would, would typically like move, movement specific deficiencies are reserved for athletes who already have a tremendous base of fitness and are already competing at a high level. And it turns out they're just not very good at strict handstand push-ups or muscle ups in the volume that's needed to perform well in the sport. So, um, athlete, you know, I, I've worked with an athlete in the off season for a couple, a couple seasons at our gym, extremely fit, pretty well rounded. Her primary deficiency is that high power output energy system. So it's not just like struggles with short, extremely explosive workouts, but Strength numbers might need to be a little bit higher relative to the field. Weightlifting numbers are similar. So it's not necessarily that the snatch needs to be improved. It's that we need to address the fact that this athlete leans more toward the slow twitch side of the fitness spectrum. And we need to develop some sort of power uh, that expands across all of the domains of fitness. The weightlifting stuff, the one rep maxes, the five rep maxes, the only total, the bike sprints you know, high power output stuff that we might see in the, uh, you know, in any level of those, those of competition. I think that's a pretty good segue to where my mind goes with it, especially at this point in the season and how I start that base is just giving, <clears throat> if there is something that you're focusing on, if we're going after something more broad, like an energy system, or we need to get your pulling gymnastics technique to where it is, or we get to focus more on power output work within weightlifting and, you know, you know, machines, high resistance machines. There needs to be room within your total volume and program for these things to actually take hold. You got to back off of other stuff. Like if you're going to focus on something this far out, um, I think it's hard for a lot of athletes because the season ends and we come back around and they want to start getting right into it and they want to focus on weightlifting. So they put a ton of time and energy into weightlifting, but they're also still doing a couple of conditioning pieces a day, a skill piece, and then it's not working and they can't really figure out why. And it's like, 
could we have the kind of session where you are drenched in sweat before you do your five by five back squat and you stand up all 25 reps as fast as you possibly can and you actually do a cool down after that and you consider that a session and then is the programming surrounding it is the next day hindering your total recovery going into the next time that you squat or did something that you did prior to that day affect it in a really big way um so it's a lot of it to me is about more eggs in less baskets and then as we go throughout the year we are trying to put those things into different places but if we want to specialize in a way even if it's at like the affiliate level if you're like I want to, I'm going to show up to class 15 minutes early and warm up and stay 15 minutes late and cool down in like a really big way and go all in on just what class has to offer. I'm not going to look at the competitor extra. I'm not going to do any extra work outside of this. Um, that can have such a profound effect. Like the people that care so much about improving in the sport are the ones that oftentimes overdo it. And they wonder why they're not seeing that progress. And it's like... Sometimes building a base is like very conditioning heavy. And if, you know, you kind of, when it is conditioning, you feel like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but if that's, you know, like the athlete that you're talking about, if that's the sweet spot, if the whatever five to 20 minute Metcon is where they're good, then it's like, okay, wow. So we really need to like get into something specific. Um, you have to have room for that to breathe. Um, or you're just going to end up in a similar place. And I do want to like, I don't want to bury the lead as you get towards the end of the season, you do need all of those things. Um, but you're hoping that you've improved so much on your power output or your endurance or your mobility or your skill that you can show it off once GPP comes all the way back around. Yeah. I think the, like, again, if, if there are to Sherb's original point, the, the, what he's referring to the hierarchy the theoretical hierarchy, the development of the athlete, you got the nutrition, word salad, you got nutrition at the base. Let's not, not that we're going to gloss over the importance of that, but above that we have the metabolic conditioning and there are a lot of tools that we have to improve that without introducing any complexity of, you know, weightlifting, gymnastics, et cetera, that could potentially slow an athlete down. We talk about that. That's more at the affiliate level where, you know, hey, I want this 20 minute workout to suck, but there's a there's a big fucking turd of 15 chest to bar pull ups that smack in the middle of that AMRAP. And, you know, it's running, it's wall balls and then it's chest to bar pull ups. And it's like, well, we can get really fit if it's just back and forth with running and wall balls. But once we introduce the chest to bar pull up for a lot of athletes, that becomes a sticking point. That's when, you know, this is no longer 20 solid minutes of high intensity cardio and it's a couple minutes of running and wall balls, then it's like practice or it's maybe it's, you know, it's a skill movement that isn't necessarily eliciting the stimulus that we want in this workout. And that athlete might be better off with, you know, jumping pull-ups again, kind of a dumbed down version for the affiliate level, but we can do the same thing with competitors. It's like, I can't, I can't string five con unbroken muscle ups together repeatedly. Am I better off doing two or three of them in this workout. It's like, maybe, maybe it's, we're better off doing some chest to bar pull-ups or chin over bar pull-ups, not because we want to omit that movement, but because we are chasing a stimulus rather than the movement itself. And then we can plug that move, that very specific movement that's giving you trouble into a skill session or whatever. So we can develop kind of using that mechanics consistency and then intensity mantra that crossfit brings there's essentially kind of an answer to every question in in the in the l1 manual somewhere right it's like i i, I want to get a good workout here but i can't do muscle ups very well it's like okay let's pull the muscle up out of the workout let's work on the mechanics and the consistency of that movement once we have those two things dialed in then we can inject some intensity by plugging it back into that 20 minute am wrap i think it's important to yeah. recognize that it's not always like a it's not a or B, sometimes it's a, a scale because I would argue kind of conversely to that point that sometimes it's important for an athlete in their training occasionally to be given a turd and have to figure it out. Like, I, I don't think that's necessarily a terrible thing if it happens occasionally, 
But I think the problem is people live in a world where it's, I always do all it's exactly what's on the whiteboard or I change it completely. There's no gray area in the middle. I would argue mm. for stimulus purposes, you're absolutely right, Hunter. You, you yeah, make the workout a version that's something you can hammer to get the point of the workout. But I would say everybody in this, in this podcast right now started CrossFit, I think at dot on dot com or at the affiliate where it's like, fuck, I'm RX, bro. Watch this shit. I'm going to do 30 muscle ups. It takes 30 hours, but I'm going to do 30 fucking muscle ups. And there was some level of that that helped. I don't know if it was the ego or the forced practice that the high volume creates, but there definitely is some value in that. It's just the trouble is that people hear that and they're like, that's the permission. Now I can always do workouts that I'm not supposed to be doing because, because coach said, hey, that one time I wanted to do these 30 muscle-ups in the workout. It's, to, it's important to recognize that nothing is A or B, on or off, that it's, it's, a, it's a spectrum that it's on. Yeah, and you're kind of explaining a little bit like the mind of a competitor. If I go to do something and I'm, you know, with the bros and everyone's crushing it and I'm not, it's a really good chance that I'm going to figure out what I need to do to get there. Yeah. So like you're put into these moments of, and if you just always stand on the sidelines and watch other people, you know, smash their clavicle into the pull-up bar while they're trying to figure out a bar muscle up and you're off to the side doing like strict bandit or something like that and you're never trying to to get that then i completely agree with that and it shows up more and more as the season progresses if you don't take those moments later on in the year then you're going to end up back at a very similar place because skill work is skill work you need repetition you need to practice before you're going to absolutely hammer yourself i actually thought of something when hunter was talking about the the like original you know i don't i don't know if it's necessarily the l1 manual but i remember the the, the very first programming document that coach glassman put out and we have a our our affiliate programming has a, a free add-on that's uh we call engine programming and there's a 60 minute run i believe in it either 60 minute run or a 60 minute machine and one of our affiliates went on that Discord. Was for, that was for Hell Week specifically. Yeah. And one of our affiliates went on there and was like, who would program this? And I felt very proud that in my mind, it was like every single person that works in Misfit Athletics would program this on the affiliate level. And I think the math worked out to like once every 12 days, Glassman said, long, slow, monostructural. So it's like, it come, it shows up once and the like alarm bells go off and it's like yeah. well i mean even at the original when we're just rotating through you know m mg you know wg you know that whole song and dance it was like it's gonna come it's you know there there's three in a cycle there's three m's and one of those m's is true model structural conditioning but the bias is like, wild go it's just like go i want to do what i want to do i don't want to do, do that distance he's <laughs> always been there we all skipped it. We skipped it forever. I did, for sure. <laughs> um, 5K run? But you could tell. You? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's interesting that you can always draw back to those things. Everything, like, we've obviously, everything continues to, like, spider web out and, and uh, all these new topics and all these new ideas, but it's so easy to trace it, like, up and back to the yeah. original document that, that we got there. Yeah. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is read to you guys the movements um, that pop up the most at each stage. And it would take way too long to say, like, how do you get better at each of these movements? But I do want to talk about the idea in general of something on this list, no pun intended, sure, being able to trip you up um, or... <laughs> um, versus again, just this idea of GPP It's like, we can get better at a lot of these things without a lot of practice, but I think there's some really interesting questions. So, um, for starting at the open every year since 2019, double unders, it's the only movement that's been Fuck. in the open every single year. Um, so, and that <laughs> is not <coughs> really a great candidate for GPP. Um, as we've seen, Kyle and Sherb are two of the fittest people I know. <laughs> what do you mean oh, a great and, candidate and for best GPP? At for for she, you, you better know how to do the fucking movement. Reflecting GPP, yeah, yeah, athlete. yeah. Um, thrusters, five times, five out of six. Um, That's a terrible movement. Should be kicked out. Toes to bar, 
rowing, yeah, burpees, exactly. chest to bar, and bar muscle ups four out of six years. And we'll stop there. Um, so obviously we have our double unders and our rowing and our bar facing burpees, the kinds of things where if your GPP, if your energy systems are there, you should be able to express that. Um, thrusters, like absurdly metabolically demanding movement, large loads, long distances. Um, but then we have the toe to bar, we have the chest to bar, we have the bar muscle up. And I think a lot of people go through the year that are trying to progress in the sport and just wonder what am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to just be doing the intervals and like getting after the monostructural and doing my weightlifting? And these come up in a Metcon and I feel like I'm fitter than my score reflects. Like, how am I supposed to do this? So if you guys reframe the question a little bit, just the idea of having an open athlete and taking them through this journey and like, you have to be good at those movements to do well. You 100% have to be good at those movements to do well in the open. And there are people that don't do CrossFit that are very fit that if they try to do those movements, it would be hilarious. So how do we figure out the like you alchemy said, You said of, seven movements. So it was row, burpee, double under were kind of the monostructural, thruster, and then toe to bar, chest to bar, bar muscle up. Those Did are all those of right? the movements that have been programmed four to six times in the last six years in the open. Yeah. So I, I'm going to just draw, I'm going to create, I guess three categories those those all move those movements fall into three categories maybe one of them the the gymnastics pulling so all three of those movements have in common the most fundamental gymnastics hollow arch positioning so an athlete who can't do that combination of grip and pulling strength as well right so all three of these movements that are all look a little bit different are all extraordinarily similar in like their foundations row burpee double under exact same thing and then thruster i almost put thruster into that camp you could almost make these two different categories they're metabolic movements they mm -hmm. require the concept like i would say row and thruster are almost a group in that they need they have a requirement to understand basic like sequencing of movements the correct like they, there is a technical element to both of those movements that where if you do things in the incorrect order, you know, if you pull with your arms on the handle and then you lean back and then you push your legs in, push your feet into the foot pad, I don't even know what the fuck that would look like, but it wouldn't look I've like the it. correct rowing stroke, right? Same, similarly, you don't get an athlete to the bottom of their front squat, tell them to press the bar overhead and then stand it up, right? There's a seat, there's a proper sequence that needs to occur in order for those movements to be done correctly and efficiently. And then like, row burpee double under like those are tools that crossfit uses to force you to express fitness like it's that that's kind of how i think of those things they're not it's not seven independent movements with seven different characteristics attached with each of them they are yep. all associated with the exact same kind of fundamentals you want to go crossfit l1 it's like okay core to extremity movement for sure large loads long distances quickly and like it's all of these things are just tools that are used to express foundational movements, foundational elements of like of human movement. My my mind again goes to does the athlete have an issue with the movement itself or are they just kind of not fit? And if they're not fit and you're asking me like what do you do in the programming? It's like, all right, well, we need to boost your energy systems depending on which one it is, and then using the bitch work where the scale element is sort of subtracted from it to increase the work capacity. And then I would give this athlete homework on the side, like, oh, you really don't like chest of bar pull-ups? Here's the ladder you're gonna do twice a week, or here is the EMOM you're gonna do three times a week, or here is the, you know, here's the AMRAP with rest injected into it that I want you to practice at ascending loads so you get comfortable with being desensitized to movements because I would argue outside of energy systems and skill, it's the negative mental bias you have towards movements that has to be out trained in your head to the point where you just don't fucking care that you're doing another burpee box jump over or that you're really, really gassed, but you still got to flick the wrists and jump two inches off the ground or, you know, whatever the movement is. I would argue that if it's not energy systems and it's not a skill, it's the desensitization to the movement that will allow you to 
express your fitness because you just don't fucking care because guess what? You spent the last nine months doing 12 trillion thrusters and you don't give a fuck that they throw, you know, 35 or 50 of them at 95 pounds in front of you. You're like, yeah, big fucking deal. I've done 100x that this season. The, I think about this if we're talking about every group that we referenced at the beginning, open quarterfinals, semifinals, CrossFit games. I think about this as a slider of how long we would be focusing um, more on general fitness versus sports specific. I think the open athlete, because of volume, should be sports specific most of the year. So they should be doing Metcons and intervals. They should for be the doing most CrossFit. Part. They should be doing CrossFit. They should yeah. be biasing double unders, thrusters, toes to bar, rowing, bar facing burpees, chest to bar pull ups, bar muscle ups. Um, the funny thing is, I'm not going to read the rest of the list, but when Hunter was talking, it was so easy to categorize these things. And that's exactly what I do in a, in a remote coaching athlete assessment. So we start to put those things together because if you're going to tell me <laughs> you like this movement, or you don't like this movement, and we start to see, okay, this group of movements is all in the red category, um, then it's something that we need to address. I still stand by the GPP um, idea earlier in the season for an open athlete being the style of programming that lets everything breathe. Do not hammer yourself early on in the year. Get really good at the old school kind of one and done vibe. And then as the year goes on, if you take good notes and you have a good athlete IQ, you're gonna see the writing's gonna be on the wall that I need to go walk into my coach's office and say, hey, I need a nine week toe to, bar, toe to bar progression or chest to bar, or you know, can we stay after and work on bar muscle ups, that sort of thing. So we're actually thinking about it from the perspective of CrossFit, you know, starts at the very latest in the fall. Um, and if you're an affiliate athlete, probably sooner than that. Um, and you're sticking with that the whole year. And maybe the biggest thing that you do to make it more sports specific is practicing the things that you're not good at that are on that list. Like, they're going to give you the answers to the fucking test. Shame on you. You for not could, studying. what would, well, what would be a real fucking shame is the athlete that pours their heart and soul into conditioning, doesn't clean these things up. And then someone who's half-assing conditioning, but knows the answers to the test and has practiced a shitload of double unders and toes to bar and bar muscle ups and those things, that person might win in the open. They have a little bit more athlete IQ there. So that's how I think about this and how, again, if, you know, if each of us have remote coached the full spectrum, so you're going into a new season, you're having these conversations with people and the more the the fitter they are the more you're going to back off of sports specific kind of early i think personally i wouldn't the disagree fitter. with that you're segmenting things so like a crossfit games athlete will start with more weightlifting sure. yeah, in the off season yeah. monostructural yep. and yep. skill and yep. we're going to bias something that they need to to really get better at yeah it's yeah it's funny it's almost like the the higher level the com, the crossfitter the more traditional their like early season training yes. is and it goes it's like co i mean cody's a great example of that right he can yep. he can stay fit by just running probably not squatting running and let's say running and power he does, cleaning he does for like nine four months things, out bro. of the year but he'll do like you know run you know run row is power clean, one of ghd things, sit sure? up and rope climb <laughs> and he does genetics. he can do crossfit for let's four weeks genetics. and and get back into it but um, yeah yeah. All right. We're going to talk about the Cody in a lab coat. <laughs> the quarter, oh, Jesus. The <laughs> quarterfinals list. Hunter, we did content on this last week, so you don't get to guess. Sure, there have been three movements that have been in every quarterfinals. Do you know what they are? Rope climb. You seen the video? Ding. I haven't actually. <laughs> I'm going to say rope climb, handstand, push up. Uh. I don't remember the other answers, so. Burpee Hold box on. jump over, rope climb, and rowing. Yeah. Well, there's some fucking serious GPP in that. Like, those are, <laughs> like, we've we've slid up from the open to quarterfinals, and it's like, how much will our answer actually change? Um, the movements that have been in three of the four years, GHD sit-ups, Hunter has a theory that those might be gone, especially in high volume, because of how many people they're letting in. Uh, so that'll be interesting. Agreed. That'll be a potential update to our data. 
Um, <clears throat> muscle up, snatch, strict handstand, push up, wall ball. And yeah, that's it. And then I'll just do the, the movements that have come up twice because there aren't too many more of them. Front squat, handstand, push up, pistol, chest to wall, handstand, push up, and clean and jerk. So you kind of might be right, sure. There's been a lot of handstand push uping, but it's been of different variety. Yeah, I saw it. Actually, it looks clear, like but... 2023 had zero, had no. Oh no, they had chest to wall. Um, so tech technically, if you wanted to have gymnastics pressing in there, that could be one of the things. But they kind of switch it around, and to be honest, they are they are fairly different. So when we look at the like big three there. Um, I mean, there's technique, of course but they rely so heavily on. I think it's really annoying that the rope climb to me is very annoying. This is like if someone is relatively good at climbing a rope, which there aren't that actually that many people, and they're fit, they just murder people in Metcons. You see it at the affiliate level. Super the scores easy. are all over the place. And like for me, it's like those are so fucking metabolically demanding. It's crazy. That's when I see someone shimmy workouts. up the rope three to five <laughs> times, in a in a metcon round after round it just blows my mind but we watched last year i mean really high level athletes moving like crap in the rope climb and you could tell that that was a major hindrance to their score like you look at that workout as a whole and the way that they broke it all up and like these athletes with again with their gpp with their skill level on a lot of things should have annihilated that workout and they weren't able to because of those sets of rope climbs it's just kind of fascinating to watch yeah i mean to be fair that workout just constantly built fatigue on fatigue with that gymnastics yep. chipper but you're definitely right in the rope climb and i when we shot that media i made a point to talk about the fact that none of the quarterfinals workouts like i think i want to i feel like this is, I don't have any evidence to back this up, so it was just a feeling, but for the most part, when rope climbs got programmed early on, it's like one or two of them, right? Like, if you saw an, a rounds for time or an AMRAP where it was like three rope climbs at once, it was like, Jesus fucking Christ, what do you got, seven days to do this rope climb workout? <laughs> Tommy and now it's like, <laughs> And now it's like, we need to batch this movement in a way that it's like, it's almost like a rope climb and a muscle up are the same thing. It's like, you're going to, yeah, you're going to finish this workout with nine rope climbs two, two years ago in some, in quarterfinals. Right. First, first year it was like, yeah, six, five, four. And also your hip flexors and quads don't work. So enjoy climbing the rope like that. So it's a, it's, it's far more of a, it's equal parts conditioning as it is. It's equal parts M as it is G in CrossFit terms, equal parts monostructural as it is, as it is gymnastics, I think at this point. And you're right at like, we see at the affiliate level, like there are a shitload of athletes out there who, whose fitness level may not be the highest, but we, do, we, we know how to teach climbing. We know how to teach people how to climb rope and our athletes know how to listen and then they climb rope correctly. And I'm like, like, I know you're not as fit as a CrossFit Games athlete, but you are climbing rope better than many of the CrossFit <laughs> Games athletes I've seen climb rope. They just happen to be a little bit rope climbs and back rowing. it up. Yeah. It's the same thing. Holy shit, rowing. Don't even get me don't even get me started on it, watching I, I a CrossFit Games athlete row. I can't I can't fathom it's the amount of males. Start fathoming. <laughs> Again, with the me fathom. GPP oh. levels <laughs> that like are unheralded in human history that lead with their upper back. It's with, incredible. They just they get into a position. I'm only that you gonna would push think. off my big toe. Dom's only rowing off his fucking big toe and index toe, leaning back. Yeah, I, I it's crazy, and you see, and there, and I think what happens is they see their output on the screen. And it's better than most people's. Yeah, and, and it's go, like, what are you gonna like? I'm care. gonna fix this. Like, yeah, it's like ah, but you could be the best. My favorite is just you. Why did I? I let's go to your leaderboard. Seventh, ninth, fourth, fifth. Why isn't it first? If you're so fucking great at rowing, if you're the yeah. best <laughs> rower in the world, then why didn't you come in first place? Why didn't you win that? And it's like, okay, take your GPP and your fitness level, and let's. Show you how to row, and then you can win. Why was no the five one? six guy okay. one of the best at the rowing? <laughs> it's crazy because everyone else, someone everyone, someone everyone instantly within six inches of their pull makes themselves a foot shorter. That's what they're doing. They're taking all the leverage that they have over the handle and saying, "Nah, I'm good." Why would you want okay. that? Okay, 
tangent over. I'm across for now. enough physicists, Drew. Sure. Where does your mind go when you hear these movements compared to that open list and how you would approach the offseason for an athlete? Uh, I mean, they got to be sprinkled. They got to be in there. They have to be included because a lot of those things can be extreme roadblocks. If you don't have the tolerance to the volume of 60 GHD sit-ups or six rope climbs back to back, like <laughs> a lot of times for an athlete, that's a, an exposure thing. You know, you fail fail at the margins of your experience and if you've never done something like that and you don't know how your body's going to tolerate that you're not going to be prepared when it counts but you also have to be very smart about how you do that you know if i told an athlete all right you got to be ready for 100 ghd said 180 ghds i want you to do 300 every week from now until <laughs> springtime they're going to be three inches tall because their fucking <laughs> clavicles are going to be connected to their hip flexor so the idea here is they need to have those opportunities to do those things but more often than not depending again slightly different category here you look at the ghd you need exposure so that you don't do that workout and get fucking torched to the point where you can't compete the rest of the weekend whereas if you look at the rope climb it's like all right did you spend the time in the off season figuring out what kind of rope climb workout is this do you need to do two pulls do you need to do three how fast do you need to, be able to cycle through your reps are you efficient with how you lock in do you move the same way every single time and you know those movements kind of specifically like rope climbs or, uh, you know, high volume gymnastics is like there are nuances to your movement or the reason why you don't have the capacity that others do. And it's up to you to figure out what they are. And that means they start in skill sessions and gradually progress or progress, progress to what feel like conditioning pieces where you have that kind of volume, but it needs to make a logical progression from one thing to the next, because, you know, yes, you could throw, 100 GHD sit-ups in the middle of your 20-minute AMRAP and just say, hey, I'll only get to that 100 GHD once and I'll be my my volume there. But that, does that teach you how to to tolerate something like that if it's just sprinkled in once every three to five weeks? The answer is probably not. So um, I, I look at those things and like you need to build capacity. And if you're of that caliber and you plan on competing, you have to have studied and done your homework to realize like this is what you're getting into. You might like the fucking 20-minute AMRAP of 6, 8, and 12. Like, awesome that's not what you're that's not the level you're going to be at and that's not going to necessarily how they test you when it comes time and while you can't necessarily guess the exact answers to the test you used to have an idea of how they've been programmed in the past and that historical context can inform you on all right if this thing were to come up am i ready for it and the answer is no well, then you need to start making a game plan for how you can get yourself from where you are right now where maybe 70 ghds is your tolerance to 120 to 150 to Fuck, give me 500. I don't care. But it needs to make sense for who you are as an athlete and what your goals are. Yeah, this is the this is the category of athlete where I would start to, for a somewhat short period of time in the offseason, but I would start to segment their programming for the most part. Um, and there's a way that you do this as a remote coach, and then there's a way that we do this for the masses um, in terms of you know people following our, our hatchet program to prepare for quarterfinals in 2025 as a remote athlete you have the ability to like if i'm going to have this person do intervals or metcons is a pretty good chance that there's a movement in there um that i want them to to experience under fatigue um and if i'm going to give them upwards of of three pieces a day we're gonna know our main opponent on all days we're gonna know like hey i am gonna let you front squat today but i'm gonna back off the percentages you can do the rope climbs after but these rowing intervals are that's just what your day is this is what you're going to like really lean into um and you can make the kind of progress with that where you notice it across different domains time domains and different movements as we get into the fall um on the hatchet side um, if you are following our, our programming, um, without a coach, one of the rules that, that we've all had for off season one and off season two is if it smells a little complicated or if this set looks a little too big, no, like we're not going to do that. We're going to keep things very simple. So while there is CrossFit or an interval programmed daily, if you're on the conditioning track to go with your bitch work, um, it's kind of still very conditioning heavy. It's not super high skill. Like, again, I was reading down through these movements. 
in the open list and it's like yeah they have snatch and dumbbell snatch and and deadlift but it's often used for fitness just you don't like tool. end up yeah you just, just end up there and like i can't lift this weight anymore it's too heavy unless it's you know sort of something that's progressing there so it's being used as a tool to push you and we can write metcons um that do the exact same thing like we're asking you to do manageable sets of dumbbell snatches running and wall balls or something like that like that's a hamster wheel that's not that much different um if you have a decent athlete iq than doing you know intervals that are that are dumbed down more or just monostructural conditioning i mean i think that's where you start to as an athlete try to understand the difference between training and testing right it's like in training a lot most of the time like I don't want you to have to get stuck. Like there are places where you like Sherb was talking about where it is like, yeah, here's a set of 50 chest to bar pull-ups. Like how are you going to do it? It's like, well, if if the workout was programmed with 50 chest to bar pull-ups in it, then it was like whoever wrote the workout knew what they were probably knew what they were doing. I'll, I'll probably if, if it was written by us or HQ, I'm going to assume that they they we definitely knew what they were doing. CrossFit HQ almost certainly knew what they were doing respectfully but like if it's in there like there's a purpose for it and it's like we're deliberately trying to test capacity here but it doesn't happen all that often the higher the level you get to there are obviously movements where it's like you know the workout ends with 10 chest to wall handstand push-ups it's like here this is clearly meant to be like can you do this and that's fine and that's that has a place for itself in a test but if you're typical Monday through Friday training always has a movement in there that's like, am I going to be able to do this or not? I don't know. We're going to find out. It's like, that's not how you're going to develop fitness. Uh, it's okay to do that every once in a while. And that again, toes the line between training and testing. But when we're trying to improve fitness, having those big, you know, the, the barbell weight, that's like, fuck, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to really strategize how to do this because it's way too heavy for me. Or Here's that set of 30 muscle ups. Like, what am I, how am I going to approach this? Okay. Singles got it. Like, that's not how we're going to improve for the sport when it actually matters. We need to toe that line between training and testing when it's time to be training. Got to get out of that black and white mindset. I think that's the important part there. What you just said, it's okay if it happens occasionally, but you have to know the intent. And if you don't know the intent, that's where you you know, you look yeah, and for help. by occasionally, like that sort of specific example, that's like, you know, the one out of 10, like the rest of the time I need you to be, because also when you think about the, the workouts or the tests that end with the barbell that, you know, maybe only a certain percentage of people can actually lift or a gymnastics movement where it's like, Hey, this is for time, but it has a time cap where most athletes are going to get stuck on that last movement. Like, that's fine, but the problem, like what you're missing, like, the athletes immediately glue themselves to that thing. It's like the hardest thing. It's like, motherfucker, you got to get there first. Like, don't worry about those 20 muscle ups at the end of the workout. Like, I need your fit. I need you to have enough fitness to get there. And then we can worry about muscle ups. But if you don't have the fitness, it doesn't matter. And I think that's, you know, the open is that is what that is meant to serve as. It's like you've been working on your legless rope climbs and deficit handstand push-ups, and it's like, oh, that's good. Here's a dumbbell and some burpees. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Enjoy decent that. segue to semifinals. Um, one movement that is close to the tip of the spear for us that we use pretty regularly is running and has not been mentioned as an open athlete or a quarterfinals athlete that that you need to be good at. Um, I am not very specifically not talking about affiliate programs right now. What is your guys' opinion on volume of running specifically for an open or quarterfinals athlete throughout the year? You got to do it occasionally because it's a great stimulus, but I don't think it supersedes some of the other more common movement that you will see in the sport at the stage they're going to compete at. So, you know, I think this is coming. If I do monostructural who, four days a week, mm, I mean, at I, I think I would season, think in how a, often would you think I do you think I should run? Yeah, yeah. If, if it's if it's four times a week, I would say every two weeks you need to have at least one of those sessions be so one every eight sessions should be running, and it should be a variety because I think the 
one of the things that I that bothers me a little bit about the zone two work is that people think that's the only kind of running they need to do moving forward. And coming from personal experience, I did a shitload of zone two stuff. And for a long time, I felt a lot slower because I never trained anything that resembled speed work and running. And it is something that creates force and you have to do it. And, you know, on vacation, I decided, you know what, I hadn't done in a really long time. I honestly think back to as far back as like 2016 or 17, we went to um, the Eastern Prom and we did that hill sprint with the with the entire camp. I went over down the street, jogged down the street about 600 meters and I was like, all right, I'm going to go run that hill and I'm going to run it a couple of times until I get you know sad and tired and I don't want to do this anymore. And I got myself somewhere between like 10 and 12, like 50 meter sprints up a hill. And I did the workout and I was like, oh, I feel like I'm getting a really good stimulus here and I'm not super fucked up yet. Like I don't feel beat up. I'm not killing myself. I did enough volume to get better at this. I tried really hard. It's a good workout. I'm on vacation. I'm like, fuck off. Fuck it. Move on. The next day I was so fucked up from running really hard. I used yeah. muscles and I used, you know, just things I hadn't done in a really, really long time. And it quickly made me realize like, fuck Bozo, you got to get some speed work done on your own two feet. You can't just always go run nice, easy 10 minute miles that, you know, do improve your aerobic capacity, but fuck, they make you slower if you only do that and you don't train running hard. So well, you're explaining endurance training, right? So if you're an endurance yeah. athlete, th thumbs up, <laughs> do most of your, do most of your work long and slow because you are in a long and slow sport. But if that's the basis, if you basically, what you're explaining is how the CrossFit community both at the affiliate level all the way up to people coaching games, athletes overcorrect. Yeah. They find out something works as an ingredient and they're like, Eat here's, this this ingredient. Di here's this dish of paprika. <laughs> Get a spoon and start shoveling that shit down. I tried a sprinkle of it in one dish. It really pepped it up. So now we're just going to eat paprika. 85 of them. <laughs> Fucking delicious. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if I have that answer the question, my... but once every two weeks. <laughs> sure. I, I'm going to go with more frequently than that. For sure. Okay. Probably yeah. closer to like you used a two week span. I was confused and sure if you did. knew the measurements. Uh, he was just saying, so I, he probably didn't want to say half a day a week. So he said. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm going to say like between once and twice a week, I think can move the needle. I here, here's my, and here's my justification. Someone who's a good rower is not necessarily a good runner. Someone who is a good runner, I would say is more likely to be a good rower. Someone who can run well in various energy systems, like there's a technical aspect to rowing, obviously, and it's a little more sports specific. I just, my, I, I just think running has the capacity to um, to move the needle, like minute for minute, far greater than rowing. Not far greater. Rowing, rowing's a clo very close second. But I, I think my point is, is that running is a really fucking good tool. And just because it's not tested per se at the quarterfinals and open level, it like what it does and what it requires of an athlete to move their body through space. There's a there's a fucking reason when you say go do a five minute warm up. Sorry to bring the affiliate here, Drew, but go do a five minute warm up. Everybody's like, no, C2 bike. Fuck yeah. It's like, I know why you're picking the C2 bike. One it's muscle it's group and there's easy. a seat. <laughs> it's a it's a seat. I can just the difficulty way down. I don't have That's to try very hard. And I'm I gotta still get gonna my go. legs spinning. Come on. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Okay, <laughs> you can get your legs spinning on the pavement. But yeah, it's it's ultimately like the machine machines alleviate the need to move your own body through space. It's and for whatever reason, CrossFitters are so averse to exercising in more than one single location. Um, and I I I just I think that's a mistake. I think running like I think the MF2 type running is valuable, but I mean, I an hour ago I was doing four by 800 meter run and that fucking sucks balls. And I do a decent amount of my MF2 work and I can actually feel it allowing me to recover and repeat a similar kind of output. But Should I also do know that both? I haven't. <laughs> well, yeah, but I also Weird. don't, haven't done, you know, that shitty like sure. a 400 and yeah, yeah. 800 yep. um, a one mile the the one mile repeats that often and it's like it's going to take a lot of energy for me to go a little bit faster and it just sucks like there i think there's just so much to be said about what running can do for your fitness we can train it we can train every energy system just using your own two feet and a pair of sneakers and that's 
get the hills, get the, you know, it's, there's, there's just so much that it can do for fitness that I think it's silly that it gets avoided. That was one thing that I felt like was really fascinating about specializing in something for a short period of time is like when you are training for a long race, a lot of your mileage is very slow, but you also, a lot of the programs have pretty gnarly, you know, one mile repeats, two mile repeats, 800, 800 meter repeats, those sorts of things. And you could feel each thing that you were doing, making the other thing better back and forth the whole time. Yeah. So you would do like, you would do your zone two stuff. And just like you said, like in the endurance community, they do not take long rest between their intervals. <laughs> like their intervals, yeah. the, the, their rest periods are pretty short. And that's when you would get done and you know, that acid would be pumping through your veins and you're like, I can't do this again but you've logged those miles and actually from a cardiovascular standpoint, you are going to be able to come back down and, and get that done. But then that like super high intensity and crazy high heart rate, you could tell would push that floor down on the zone two work. And you'd go back to a zone two run after a rest day, after you accumulated a few of those runs and you would be running significantly faster at a lower heart rate, especially towards the beginning. Um, so that's always cool to see. I, think you both gave the correct answer at different times of the year. I would lean on what Hunter is saying for right now. And I would be closer to sure. what Sherb is saying come January. Like that's the type of, again, slider and progression. Like we can, the only, the only machine, the only thing that they're going to ask you to do is rowing. So if you don't, double down on that for a significant portion of the year. If you're not rowing every single week the whole year, then you're probably doing something wrong unless you're a giant crossfitter or fucking road crew in college or whatever it is. Like you're going yeah, to be I think able to do that. The only, the, the caveat where I was stumbling between running and rowing and its efficacy is just the fact that there's such a, there's a much more technical component to rowing. Like do we were talking about it. There are a lot of people who can can row but do so very poorly it's like well your heart rate's probably high as fuck because you're rowing so goddamn poorly and you're going to be on that thing for hours at the pace that you're rowing at but um i think that well, if if you can row technically proficiently they're like running and rowing are the are the probably the biggest bang for your buck but again there's just there's like you can you can pull on the handle and you can sit back at the end of that rowing stroke and there are still going to be meters ticking by. You stop moving your legs, you will literally fall flat on your face when you're running <laughs> or you will just literally accumulate zero meters. So I think like there's still a lot to be said about moving yourself through space and not having the reprieve of, oh, I can just turn the damper down. I can just cruise. I can maybe I'll take my feet off the pedals for a second and just go arms only on the assault bike or I'm going to take... I'm going to row at 18 strokes per minute and take a couple of deep breaths between my strokes. It's like you don't get you don't get that that reprieve with running. What would you say to someone in that circumstance, Hunter, though, that, you know, we know running is one of the harder things on an athlete's body. And if you're looking at like things you could pick up casually to, you know, improve your fitness that have the highest risk for injury, running's a pretty high one. Obviously, there's some ownership for like how you move when you run. Does that play a concern in your mind at all? That like the fucking hatchet athlete that is only going to be on the rower is accumulating junk miles or you know junk reps on their body because they run like dog shit. My even if they're, comeback, even if they're fast. Yeah, my comeback to that would just be the uh, if if running is beating your body up specifically, I I would be surprised to learn that nothing else about CrossFit was not beating you up. It's like. Yeah, those hundred thrusters and double fran, that was fine. But as soon as I go for a mile run, my knee's gonna fall Implode. out of my shirt, like my my pants. So it's <laughs> Fuck, like your knees fall out of your shirt. Yeah, my knees fall out of shirt. The wrong, shirt that's the wrong spot, that's how guy. fucked up. Yeah, now your knees Four in the wrong spot, dog. <laughs> yeah, easy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a a smart ass answer to that. I I understand that it can be impact. You know, a lot of impact. We're also talking about running like twice a week at most, right? So again, if that is so debilitating on your body. My guess is that there are some other eggs that need to be reallocated. You move like ass cheeks, baskets. you gotta fix it. Ex yeah, <laughs> something like that. Your recovery sucks. You don't actually warm up or cool down correctly. Like I, I'm, I'm not buying it. Yeah, I mean that's a whole nother 
that's a whole nother podcast. The, literally sure. the exact same like situation, but we talk about is your nutrition where it needs to be? Like, is your mobility yeah, you, where you're it an needs athlete, to be? You're like, Do I'm you getting beat up, up by cool? a day or two of running per week, but I want to be a competitive CrossFitter. It's right. like we got we yeah. got some we got to reallocate priorities here. Well, and that's one thing that I think is fun is you have the season and debrief with an athlete following like a semifinals and they've got some really they're thoughtful, but some very complicated ideas of what they need to do within their programming. Uh, And it's like, okay, RPE. Did you start, did you start counting your macros in April this year? Yes. The answer is yes. Started doing it like April to May only. So yes. what if you were fueled properly for your training? What if you literally were like, we're equating this to driving cars and you put a fucking gas in the thing and then sugar drove mine. it? Like, what if you did that for a whole year? And we trained very similarly to you last year. You put gas in your car for a whole year and drove it? Yeah, yeah. What, what Would you like move? <laughs> So, um, again, that's, that's a, that would be a side tangent there, but it's kind of a fascinating thing. So the reason why I brought up the running is because semifinals data is tough, but I think it is telling. I think they really tried in a way to standardize the sport this year. I don't know that they're going to continue to do that. We never know what the fuck they're going to do. They're going to have a quarter quell and someone's head's going to get cut off or something next year. Who knows? Right. Mm -hmm. But we saw a lot of very simple, straightforward CrossFit this year at each level. It was which great. Thank felt, fucking Christ. Right? Um, we have two movements that have come up four times each in two years. Running and echo bike. <laughs> we need more echo bike, I think. Multiple times. We too, need more well, echo bike. At least with the echo bike. No, runner had, was up. Running was three times in 2023 and then once this year and then twice for the echo bike both years um and now you can start to see why that slider would move right like we are asking for a level of output within monostructural movements and conditioning that is developed through power output work anaerobic work aerobic work zone one or zone two work like that's a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to do it. And if I ask you to do four by eight hundred with one to one rest, and you've just done five Easy. by five back squat ten seconds before, um, we might have some issues there. Yeah, wait, so, wait, wait, wait. Speaking of which, side tangent. Why the fuck, Hunter, did you make me do all those back squats yesterday and make me run today? You rude fucking asshole. Well, no, those are different I, days. I think there's a lot, a lot of people who are more upset about double Fran on Friday. And <laughs> well, that also Monday, plays in so. because that was my first workout back from vacation, and that went swimmingly. Sorry, Hunter. It was, to, yeah, it was. The, 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 those programs are in two different tabs and two different sheets, oh, so they don't, they don't, so count. Count. they don't, they don't, don't touch each other. They don't, they don't know each Mashed other. Mashed potatoes exists. ain't touching the peas. Nope. Okay. GPP. Um, <laughs> snatching three times. Nah. I skip it. Row skip it toe to bar. Bunty, don't do that. Twice each. Fine. Row toe to bar. And then is good. sort of muscle up and legless rope climb twice. So once again, we have pulling a barbell, monostructural conditioning, and pulling gymnastics like in your face at basically every level. Like to my right over here is an analysis on a whiteboard of the entire season all the way through with these movements. And if you don't like pulling, you're fucked. (laughs) Or if you don't bias pulling in a thoughtful way throughout an entire season, because like a lot of us can say unequivocally pusher or puller. Like people turn themselves into both. But when you start CrossFit, you find out very quickly, like, do I like handstand push-ups or fucking pull-ups? Like, you learn that very quick. Um, And we get, luckily, we get a little bit of crossover with the muscle-up. You get a little bit of a push-pull there. But it's it's very interesting how they program this stuff. And again, if we have the answers to the test, if we're looking at a very, very, very high level of GPP and you need to be able to pull a barbell and do pulling gymnastics, then we have a lot of 
a lot of data on how we could segment the programming for a really high level athlete. The one caveat that I'll say here is 40th place and first place are not the same athlete. They're not even remotely close to being the same athlete. So we would have probably different answers. Like the person who's coming in first, we know is advancing. So maybe that's not the right way to say it. 40th and 12th. You know, the person who was on the cusp of going to the CrossFit Games and then the athlete who maybe snuck their way in to, to get to that point. But when you guys think about at this point, we've sort of said like less sports specific as we move on because you are fitter. Um, you do, there, there's an implication that you're already good at those things. Um, how do you guys think about this with a semifinals level athlete? Are they a lower average athlete, meaning more of their places are in the tens and twelves and fifteens instead of like a couple of firsts than a turd? Like that, that would be the first place I would probably start thinking about this. Is the athlete We're going back to results again, right? We're reading yeah, the tea is leaves. The, is the athlete balanced in capacities? And guess what? You're just a couple of places a little too slow on each one of the workouts, and you were just a few points outside. And that's why you didn't qualify. And in that that's the case. The answer is a little bit different than if the athlete has, you know, second, fourth, second, first, third, 39th. Like that athlete yeah. needs something a little bit different than the athlete that's just a few, um, you know, places behind. You know, a good example of this is that, you know, you talked about with McKenna on the podcast a couple of weeks back that, you know, you were celebrating a 37th. Like that's an area for her specifically. Like, if she works on that capacity and builds that up, you know, the weekend that ends in, I forget the placing. I want to say like high twenties. Is that right, Drew? Low twenties. Low twenties. So she, she finishes that place there and she takes, you know, she takes an extra 50 to a hundred points in the positive direction, meaning she gets more points because she has higher placings. You and know? then she had the and no rep heard around the world. And then she's <laughs> sniffing, you know, sniffing Don't that qualif somebody. qualification <laughs> place instead of just like, Hey, I'm really proud of this, but like I have to fix this gap in my fitness because I need to be better at this movement. So she's the mm -hmm. athlete that's getting more of the deliberate work. Whereas, you know, and that might be segmented where it's like, hey, you just need a shitload of pulling gymnastics. You're going to go buy a pull up bar, uh, one of those door frame pull up bars. You're going to put in every door frame in your house. You walk through the door, you got to do five pull ups before you can go to the other side. Like that's who you are as the athlete. And that's what you need to, to fix that gap. Whereas it's the person who's the average, it's like, all right, like, was it, you know, mental errors that you made on the floor that caused you to to have a couple less, you know, a couple less points in each one of these workouts. That's the reason you weren't there. So it, it varies depending on the results, but I would say, you know, you have to figure out which which of those two athletes that you are. It's likely you're one or the other, not it would be weird to be both, because then it's just like, you know, are you there to, to collect a Northern Spirit t shirt? <laughs> Is that what they're called now? Northern Spirit? Yep. Northern <laughs> Spirit. Um, what a stupid ass name that is. God, I'm sorry, no spirit is so dumb. You fucking clown. They gave Austin his heat press, just the fucking film with did like the get, name and shit on it. There was a few of them in his bag. Yeah, for, they didn't explain what they were. I, I heard they, they were, were like fucking scuba suits. Fucking, you're, you're insulated. It's like a wetsuit. Hunter, you should have stole one from Austin. Could have swam with it. Yeah, <laughs> the clothes seemed fine to me. They were very like they yeah, were that's like what I heard. Yeah. I, I think they probably sent blanks and someone else did the heat pressing and maybe did it or didn't. <laughs> Some athletes didn't get any. They just got blanks with nothing yeah. on them. <laughs> That's dope. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Frank. Um, the difference in those two athletes is that was that the original question? I no, kind of got lost a little bit. Not really. No, I just don't know where I went. We've we've kind of moved on to to yeah. the higher level athlete that might need more segmented programming for question mark yeah, period of time i mean the, so the you we obviously like you have to remember that the high the higher level athlete has possesses the requisite fitness to compete at that level so in sherb's example he was like you know i know it was just a theoretical it was like first fourth ninth seventh third 39th that athlete doesn't exist what's more likely is 22nd 35th 30th seventh 14th you know right. something like that they, they you get the one athlete who does have it's probably a, specialization, a runner a weightlifter power a runner a weight yeah. exactly it's the it's the anthony davis at granite games the year we were there it was you know finished the weekend relatively low but 
the man can snatch a house. So he takes a first place finish and finds himself in the last heat for the first two days because there's so many points there. Um, and then the other, the thing with that athlete too, is that like that athlete and their coach probably know where those holes are and have either been working on it in the off season in some capacity and are just, you know, when it comes to the competition are just like, yep, we're going to see how this thing goes. Maybe it is, maybe it is that turd in the punch bowl or maybe it's not, but, um, they like the awareness is already there. The pulling gymnastics and pressing gymnastics things kind of interesting but ultimately at the end of the day we just have way more fucking pulling gymnastics movements than we do pushing and it's the same thing with barbell movements right we're limited to basically like a shoulder to overhead variant or a bench press for our pulling or for a pushing but we have Ooh. you know pretty much every i would put uh squatting into that as well just in terms of of into not pushing yeah, just just in terms of like we've got deadlift, we've got snatch, we've got clean. Like how Fair many enough. variations of a of a squat do we have where I'm not forced to pull? Sure. Okay. Fair enough. But yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just it, it's again, it's like that athlete has already demonstrated a requisite level of of GPP, like of very CrossFit level fitness, where we need to be well rounded in all categories, and we also need to be good at all of the movements. There just is that one or two weird fucking movement, that anomaly that doesn't make sense as to why they're bad at it or they just don't like it or whatever. It's like, you know, and and it just has to get worked on. I think that's where, sure, the desensitization element comes more into play for that athlete. And maybe there is a an anatomical reason or a, you know, a a, a more like specific reason for that. But in a lot of t instances, it's like, we're talking about a very specific deficiency that gets very specific attention throughout the year that we try to fix. Yeah, the the pattern starts to show up for me and will be easier to explain now that we've made it this far into the podcast. Um, a games athlete, I'm probably not asking going into to 2025 to do a, like high volume game speed CrossFit until phase three a semifinals athlete that is like, I'm definitely going to semifinals. That's probably like phase two. Um, and then a quarterfinals athlete probably needs to be practicing once, you know, between one and three times a week, game speed CrossFit starting all the way at phase one, which would be like early fall. Um, and then I, I like the idea of the open athlete being given the option to mess around with certain things over the course of a summer. Um, but it's basically... How much game speed CrossFit can you withstand over the course of 52 weeks? <laughs> and if the answer is like 40 weeks, then that's fine. But you need to get your 40 weeks in. It just has this all-encompassing effect um, that the other stuff will not. I mean, it, yeah, lots you need of athletes have tried to do the not CrossFit thing the whole year because it's like, oh my god, like I could lift so much weight. And I could do these interval, these, you know, these monostructural intervals so fast and I could crush, I could get to the point where I'm doing sets of 50 chest to bars. It'd be amazing. And then they go to do CrossFit and they're not very good at it. Can't do any of them. <laughs> Fuck. It does not work. It seems like it would work. We've all wanted it to work at some point. It does not fucking work. But the question is, when does that get, get introduced for people? And again, we make for the sake of the podcast talking to you know, however many people we are, you have to make generalizations. And that's why when Hunter's leaning a little bit more towards running versus rowing and Sherb's the opposite and I'm somewhere kind of in between, it's because we would have different answers for every single person that we talk to. Yeah, the context is is obviously the, the, the missing element here right. in the conversation. But the, yeah, I mean, somebody who needs 40 weeks of, of <laughs> high intensity CrossFit is somebody who needs 40 weeks of constantly varied functional movement performed at high intensity to yeah. get their fitness level to a place where they can actually move the needle with the independent running and rowing intervals or the five by five back squat or working on the very specific movement stuff. The CrossFit games athletes have put their thousand hour, 10,000 hours in on the handstand pushups. It's like, when we see a when we see a workout, you know, there when we're programming, there are certain 
there's certain volumes of movements that we're saying like this is acceptable. It's like if we say 100 kipping handstand push-ups is it's a that's a good dose, but that is that is acceptable to program at probably the hatchet level occasionally for a games level athlete. I don't need a games level athlete doing a fucking hundred kipping handstand pushups because they can do it because they've done that. They've done hundreds of thousands of kipping, maybe not hundreds of thousands, hundreds or <laughs> thousands of kipping handstand pushups throughout the year that like that is not going to move the needle for them as much as maybe 50 deficit handstand pushups. And oh, by the way, they have the fitness level to perform the 50 eight inch deficit handstand pushups that I have to perform a hundred regular no deficit kipping handstand pushups like that is my equivalent for that athlete and i don't need them bouncing off their neck a hundred to two hundred times just because like in order to move the needle for them in that movement i might need to tell them to do fucking 200 of them and that's retarded that's stupid well sorry for also the hard there. Uh, also in that that act <laughs> like you know maybe you're right about the 200 reps but maybe it's just like fuck you just refuse to fix the way that you Breaking move and you pause, don't dude. need that many like you don't need that many you need to work on your pressing strength in a movement that doesn't expose your neck to risk and then you need to work on the skill of how to do the movement i think we can do that in a small dose that doesn't expose the you know cervical vertebrae to disc rupturing volumes like i just I, yeah i mean honestly oh, like the way i look at it is like Fuck yeah. You you need to learn how to do the movement correctly. And, you know, people who blame movements instead of blaming themselves are just assholes. Like, you need to realize it was your fucking fault that you are hurt, not the movement's fault. Like, you decided to do it incorrectly. You decided to run before you could walk. That is your fault. And sometimes there's the, you know, we talk about ego being a double-edged sword. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's good to be like, all right, I'm going to go try this thing I've never done before, and I'll try it. But you have to realize at some point, like, you gotta take ownership over that, and that's you're the reason why it hurts you, not the movement. I think we I can use Hunter's comment to begin final thoughts. Um, he explained the journey of someone finding out how they could be a CrossFit Games athlete. You go to a CrossFit gym, you do a shitload of CrossFit. It makes all of you get a little bit stronger, you get a little bit fitter, you get a little bit more skilled, especially if you're at a good affiliate, and then you're like oh, wow, I could go off to the side and specialize this one thing, which kind of explains our open athlete track. And then, oh, wow, I actually have a chance here. I qualified for quarterfinals. Now, you know, a lot of days, maybe it is lift Metcon skill. You know, that journey begins with a lot of CrossFit and a lot of like just doing the old 21, 15, nines and couplets and triplets. And every once in a while, you're thrown into a monostructural piece. And that's when the light bulb goes off of like, if I'm going to compete, I better get better at this thing. And that's how that happens. I think people skip ahead. I think there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast that want to do better in the open in 2025. And they want to know what to specialize in. And that barrier to entry to get to that point to earn being able to specialize for a part of the year is a shitload of game speed CrossFit and figuring out like how to get that done. And again, it will make you stronger fitter more skilled while you're doing it the crossfit games athlete doesn't need that game speed crossfit as frequently because they have such a high level of fitness that performing game speed crossfit too often can actually be a detractor for the other 99 percent of us everybody needs to be doing constantly varied functional movement executed at high intensity and done in such a way that Again, like go to the original charter, live your life in couplets and triplets, run, row, bike, swim hard and fast. Like the intensity aspect is how you're going to move that needle. When I'm writing programming for the gyms, like I've, I've, I divvy up all the movements that we have into three categories, kind of the high frequency, medium frequency, and low frequency. You can be damn sure that thrusters and wall balls are going to show up a hell of a lot more often than v ups and ghd sit-ups and single arm overhead deficit, dumbbell walking lunge strict deficit handstand push-ups and all those movements because the mo the movements like the thruster the wall ball the snatch the front squat they're all the foundational movements they all have the greatest capacity to move large loads long distances quickly and again i feel like 
I'm just kind of regurgitating, stringing sentences together of the level one manual or, and you know, original CrossFit, but that's what it is. That's, and that's how these athletes got the Where fitness does sport level live on the pyramid, had. boys? Yeah. The, At the bottom, right? Top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. I got it backwards. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Reverse <laughs> Go to your local system. throwdown before beginner's class. Yeah. Fuck until, yeah. until you, until you know how to move extremely well and understand the concept of high intensity you have no business trying to specialize to the degree at which we're kind of referring to until you've gotten your you know 10,000 hours of constantly varied functional movement at high intensity man you guys have kind of already said it but the the ownership thing is I think probably the the final point I want to hammer home like you have to be extremely honest with yourself of what you actually need versus what you want to do. And that's a really hard conversation for a lot of people to have. It's like what I actually need versus what I want to do. And for a lot of athletes, it's the, you know, I want to be competitive. Competitors do 75 training pieces a day. I must therefore do 75 training pieces a day. And they don't realize that a lot of that stuff is built up over time. And they're not willing to have that conversation because it's, you know, you talk about the, the intensity element that Hunter just brought up there. Like the intensity for an athlete might be, I'm going to be so fucking focused that I'm going to hammer this four by 800 meter run as hard as I can and get every ounce that I can out of the stimulus without worrying about the fucking L sit rope climbs and the fucking deficit handstand push ups and the 365 pound power clean. Those things are all really cool, but they, at the end of the day, don't move the needle the way the intensity does. So, you know, wrapping it all up, GPP is important. Making sure you hit it with intensity is important. And, you know, don't live in a black and white world. Did we do it? Yeah. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. And thank you to our show sponsors, properfuel.co. Use the code word MISFIT. America. Sharpen the axe, co.com. Use your favorite athlete code. Them. You save 10%. They get 10%. Misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs and team misfit dot com for your affiliate programming needs see you next week peace